God, that is our prayer as we gather here today. God, as we God, as we fall before you, God, we are here to grow closer to you, to learn about you. God, as we seek your face, God, I pray that you would draw near to us, God, that you would meet us here, that you would rid us of ourselves and um, who we are on the outside, the worldliness that consumes us. And God, I pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would be present here. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Andrew, I'm a little hot, at least in my own ears. I'm not sure if it's the house or the monitors. If you could dampen me a little bit, my brother. Turn if you like. I'd encourage you to turn to Daniel 9. The text that we're mostly going to be looking at this evening is actually on your handouts. If you want a Bible to follow along, because we're going to hit some other verses too. Bud has Bibles and Pastor Dade has handouts. Please note that the handout is double-sided. I will try to keep track of which side I'm pointing you to at any given time. A couple announcements as you're getting situated. Ron Fields Memorial Service tomorrow afternoon right here in the sanctuary at 2 o'clock. Coffee and cookies to follow. What a great brother. What a precious member of our church for for many years. How blessed we are to know that he's rejoicing in the presence of the Lord. There wasn't skydiving in heaven before. <laughs> there is now. Because God, God loves Ron that much. Friday evening, Young Adults Ministry meets. I know it's two weeks in a row, but we're doing that to get our calendar oriented. Back at the Cunningham, same place that it was last week, 6.30 this week. And you can grab me after for details about that. Men's retreat, still opportunities to sign up. We've had a couple ads, a couple drops. We're still on the right side of that whole balance. You can sign up online. You can see Pastor Rob. He can walk you through it. Still opportunities to serve at the men's retreat. And again, Pastor Rob or Mike Wilson would be your best people to talk to for that. Daniel 9, we're studying Israel. We're studying the past, present, and future of Israel. And tonight we turn to the future, or as I like to call it, the future history of Israel, because it's already been written. When we talk about prophecy, it's important to understand we're not talking about predictions or things that are likely to happen. We're talking about certainties, things that will happen. Because in God's eyes, God who is outside of time, it's like they already have happened. When we talk about prophecy, we're talking about certainty. Why are we certain? Well, what we read in Scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God, and the Holy One we read in Scripture cannot lie. It's His character. It's His nature. He is truth. That's one reason we trust prophecy. Another reason we trust prophecy is because we see in 4,000 years of fulfilled prophecy, 4,000 years just since Abraham, we see prophecy after prophecy after prophecy literally fulfilled, and God has never lied. He's never fallen short. He's never been even a little bit wrong. A friend of mine got into a debate recently about a song. It's actually a song that we've brought in here recently, the song Do It Again, the chorus, your promise still stands great as your faithfulness, faithfulness, I'm still in your hands, this is my confidence, you've never failed me yet. And this was the debate, a friend of a friend says to my friend, that that's blasphemy, how can, you, how can you sing that song, how can you like that song, I don't believe they sing that song in your church, that's blasphemous, how is it blasphemous? Well, you're saying that God has never failed you yet, that implies that he might one day. Okay, the point of the song is exactly the opposite of that. The point of the song is that God has never failed me, and that tells me he never will. And, and, and the model for that song, if, if you need a biblical basis for it, is Israel. Leaf your way through Scripture, and every time Israel is walking with the Lord, in a good place with the Lord, obeying the Lord, being blessed by the Lord. They're always singing the Lord's praises 
And in singing the Lord's praises, they always declare his faithfulness. Look at the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy. Look at the dedication of the temple. Look at the dedication of the walls in in Ezra and Nehemiah. Again and again, they say, Lord, you brought us through the Red Sea, and you brought us through the wilderness, and you brought us into the land. And they recite God's faithfulness again and again and again. To to praise the the Lord for his faithfulness, for answered promise, for his protection, but also to remind themselves this is who their God is. He is God who keeps his promises again and again. What's my point? My point is just that the Bible is filled with fulfilled prophecy. Depending upon what you measure and what you count, as much as a third of the Bible is prophecy, And more than than half of the prophecy in the Bible has been fulfilled. Do the math. That's a lot of promises kept. And we've talked a lot about those kept promises over the last few weeks. The rise of Israel as a nation is the fulfillment of prophecy. Israel's exile, God's judgment of Israel because of her idolatry is a fulfillment of prophecy. Israel's restoration after 70 years in exile Likewise, a fulfillment of prophecy. And while all of that is going on, the rise and fall of the Gentile empires surrounding Israel and at times lording over Israel, also fulfillment of prophecy. Fulfillment of prophecy spoken with amazing detail, right? We looked about that at the fall of Babylon to the Medo-Persian Empire to, to Cyrus, named in Scripture, Scripture that was written, the scrolls of Isaiah, penned a hundred years before Cyrus was born, and yet there's his name. And then the fall of the Medo-Persian Empire to Alexander. Alexander, who swept across the, the empire, city by city, falling before him in the exact order that Scripture said that those cities would fall. Kept promise. Along with the kept promise that Jerusalem would not be one of those cities, The promise that when Alexander died, his kingdom would be divided into four. Again and again, we've talked about this. My point is is that that every one of those prophecies that we've talked about, every one of them that we've examined reminds us this is who God is. He's a God who speaks history before we experience it. And then God who allows history to unfold exactly the way that he's spoken of it. One of the things that we haven't dwelt on are prophecies concerning the person of Jesus, because our focus has been on Israel. But a little bit of a false dichotomy, because one of God's central purposes, if not the central purpose for Israel, is to bring forth a Messiah from Israel. Conservatively, 300 different prophecies spoken about Jesus. The time of his birth, the place of his birth, the manner of his birth, his ancestry, the fact that he would go into Egypt as a child, his ministry, that he would be a teacher, that he would be a healer, the specific miracles that he would perform, prophecies about the crucifixion, the betrayal, the death, the burial, the resurrection. 300. You've heard the illustration, I'm sure, that were we to calculate the odds of just eight of those prophecies being fulfilled. A mathematician years ago picked eight that he felt confident that he could probability weight the likelihood of it happening just by chance, just by accident. The eight that he picked, Jesus being born in Bethlehem, being betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, his clothing being gambled away for as he hung on the cross, his hands and feet pierced, his bones not broken. Jesus being born of the tribe of Judah, called out of Egypt, buried in a rich man's grave. Those are all specific prophecies written by the prophets, given by God hundreds of years before Jesus was born. And a mathematician calculated the odds that uh, of those eight being fulfilled by the same person by accident, by coincidence, at one in 100 trillion. Now, our minds don't do good with numbers that big. So he grounded it in an example to help us get a sense of the scale. If you take 100 trillion silver dollars and dump them in Texas, 
just cause. 100 trillion silver dollars will cover Texas north, south, east, west, border to border, two feet deep. The entire state of Texas, two feet deep in silver dollars. The likelihood of one person fulfilling just eight of those prophecies at random is the same as sending a blind person into Texas to wander around for as long as they want and to pick one silver dollar that you marked ahead of time correctly the first try. And that's just eight. Now take all of the prophecies about Israel leading up to Jesus and the prophecies of the nation surrounding Israel before and after the time of Jesus. Take those prophecies related to Jesus. Take the prophecies of Jesus, the ones that he spoke. We looked at a couple last week. He spoke, of course, about his death. He spoke of his resurrection. He spoke of the destruction of Jerusalem. Add those in. And then take prophecies fulfilled since Jesus. We talked about Isaiah 37, the prophecy of the Valley of Dry Bones last week. What are the odds that all of those prophecies that have been fulfilled specifically, literally, concretely, happen by chance? There's no possibility. There's no possibility at all. Because of that, we're confident as confident as we are of our own names, as confident as we are that we're in Wichita right now, that the prophecies related to the future of Israel and the return of Jesus will likewise, likewise be fulfilled. So what do those prophecies tell us? To frame the conversation, I asked you to turn to Daniel 9, right? A couple weeks ago, we introduced the prophecy of the 70 weeks of Daniel. You've got a two-sided hand down. I'm going to direct your attention to the one that looks like this. The one that says Daniel's 70 weeks or 77s. And we walked through the first few verses. You can read it in your Bible or you can read it on the handout. 70 weeks, Daniel 9, 24, are determined for your people and for your holy city. That would be Israel and Jerusalem. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Daniel 9.25, Gabriel, who's speaking this prophecy to Daniel, puts a timeline to it. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, which happened in 444 B.C., until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Seven plus 62 is 69, and you see that laid out there on the timeline. Seven weeks, that refers to the rebuilding of the city. And then 62 weeks, weeks of years, we're saying, after that, is 69 weeks of years, 69 sevens of years, 483 years, 69 times seven. Daniel 20, uh, 926, and after the 62 weeks, 62 plus seven, or 69, Messiah shall be cut off but not for himself. After that 483-year period, and, and this is review because we talked about this a couple weeks ago. If, if you weren't here a couple weeks ago or if I'm freaking you out, grab me after and, and we can do it more slowly and I can point you to some other resources. But just for the sake of refreshing our memory, after 62 weeks, plus 7 is 69 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself, we know that Jesus was cut off from the Father. He was forsaken, but not for his sins. Why was he forsaken of the Father? For our sins. That's historical fact. Historical fact that it was 69 weeks of years, 483 years from the command to rebuild Jerusalem to the triumphal entry and the crucifixion that followed a week later. 69 weeks of years. So far, so good. But the question we, we left with a couple of weeks ago was, what about the 70th week? What about that last seven-year period? Answer, it's still pending. We're still waiting. It's out there, but it hasn't happened yet. That disturbs some people. Just, just the idea of it. What do you mean, not yet? Because if we go back to Daniel 9, Gabriel's still talking. Daniel 9, 26, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end of it shall be like a flood. And, and, and I mean, Gabriel's not done. What do, you, what do you mean that 
that 483 years is, is over and, and we're still waiting. That happens in Scripture. It happens in Scripture because Scripture is inspired by a God who sits outside of time and is not obsessed with linearity and causality the way that we are. Many, many times in Scripture, a prophet, a gospel writer, even occasionally an epistle writer, will, will go from one idea to another and ignore the order in which, thing, in, in which it happens or ignore a bunch of time passing in the middle of it for the sake of completing a thought. There are many times in Scripture that, that the various authors will, will ignore the passage of time for the sake of completing a thought. Patrick, can you give me an example? Sure. When we were studying life of Christ, it happened a bunch of times where we would toggle from one gospel to another because we'd say, okay, at the end of this verse, time passes, and we don't get what happens in this author because this, with this author, Luke is, is, is a common culprit, John is another, is, you know, is going from idea to idea, and he's on a roll, so he's not stopping and talking about this other history that happens in between. If, if, if you want to look at a specific example of that, John 7 begins with Jesus going to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles, the Gospel of John chapter 7. And a series of conversations happen in and around the Feast of Tabernacles. Then we get to John 10. John 7, 8, 9, the beginning of John 10, all happened during that week of the Feast of Tabernacles. But between John chapter 10, verse 21, and John chapter 10, verse 22, all of a sudden we're thrust forward in time because all of a sudden it's the Feast of Dedication. In, in, in just one punctuation mark over the course of a period, we go from October to December. It happens a lot in the Gospels. But those aren't my favorite examples. My favorite examples, some of them, happen in the Gospel of Isaiah. And if you don't think I'm not itching to start our study in Isaiah, you're wrong. I really am. Isaiah 9. Keep a finger in Daniel if you're looking at Daniel, but flip over to Isaiah 9 with me. We've been here before, but it bears repeating. Because every Christmas, Isaiah 9, we're reminded, verse 6, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there'll be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. How much of that has been fulfilled? Two lines. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The rest of it is still pending. Jesus, in his first coming, fulfilled those first two lines. Jesus was born as a child. The Son of God incarnated and tabernacled among us. The rest is still pending. The rest will be fulfilled in his second coming. The first coming and the second coming. 2,000 years and counting, separated there by a semicolon. Go to the end of Isaiah. Go to Isaiah 61. Jesus, after his baptism and after being tempted in the wilderness by Satan, returns, teaches in the synagogue. He's handed the scroll of Isaiah. Now, whether that was the planned reading for that day or Jesus asked for that particular scroll, we're not sure. But either way, by divine appointment, Jesus read the mission statement given for Messiah in Isaiah 61 that day. The Spirit of the Lord, Isaiah 61, 1, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, except that Jesus didn't read that last line. He read, if you, if you look in Luke chapter 4, he read up to the point where it says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and then he closed the book. Then he rolled up the scroll. He was done. He stopped at a comma because the day of vengeance of our God happens when? At the second coming of Jesus. 
Jesus paused at a comma, and we've been living in that comma for almost 2,000 years. What happens in that comma? What happens is the church age. What happens is the age of grace. And if you flip over to this, to this side of your handout, you see the church age reference there in a handy-dandy visual. The church age, the age of grace. The age in which Jesus says, Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. That's a prophecy. And you and I are fulfillment of that prophecy. Since Pentecost, that prophecy has been unfolding. Jesus has been building his church, the ecclesia, the called out ones, where neither Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, slave nor free, makes an iota of difference. We're all called to be one body. We're all called to be his bride, indwelt by his spirit for the first time in human history. The Holy Spirit would from time to time come upon someone in the Old Testament, but only in this age do we see the Holy Spirit indwell us. We're called, we're built up, we're sent out, we've been reading on Sunday. We're the church. But there's going to come a point, you see that church age has an end. We don't know when it is, and it hasn't happened yet because we're still here. And it could happen at any time, our friend Charlie Campbell, and by the way, I should credit him I'm with permission borrowing his handouts here, he points out that there is no necessary preceding condition. There's no precondition, no prequalification. The rapture of the church could happen at any time. The church age could end at any time. When the number of the Gentiles has come in, we read in Romans 11.25, when the last person who's going to get saved during this age of grace gets saved, we don't know that number. It's not clear that Jesus knows that number. But when that number happens, the Father says to the Son, go get your bride. And that's an event we call the rapture of the church. Talked about this last year, almost exactly a year ago, I think, when we were in Thessalonians. We talked about it the year before that when we were in Matthew 24, so I'm not going to do a deep dive on it tonight. Again, new idea, something that you want to brush up on, grab me after, I'll talk to you all day or I'll point you to resources that you can read all night. But tonight I want to keep focused on Israel. When the church age ends and God removes his church from the world, he returns his focus to Israel. When I was teaching Revelation a bunch of years ago, I used an illustration that I wasn't sure would work, but a bunch of people said it, it clicked for them. If, if you've ever watched competitive chess on TV or in a movie or, or, or maybe you play chess, Competitive chess, they play with a chess clock, and it's a two-way clock. When it's your turn, the clock is, is running on your side. When you make your move, you hit the clock, and the clock starts running on the other person's side. So the idea is when it's running for, for one player on one side of the board, it's not running on the other side of the board and vice versa. When the clock is running for the church age, things are paused on God's clock. God's calendar, God's schedule for Israel. But when God says, stop, church age is over, the clock starts running again for Israel. And when God removes the church from the world, sometime after that, the 70th week of Daniel, that last seven-year period, that one week that we see on the far side of this handout begins. And some of you just said, what? Some, some time after? Wait a minute, I thought the rapture of the church began the 70th week of Daniel. I thought the rapture of the church, God, God hit the chess clock and, and, and time started running. Not necessarily. And, and I'm going to pause and camp out here for just a second because many of us were, if I say enraptured, you're going to groan, so I'm not going to say it, enthralled with the Left Behind series back in, back in the 90s. And, 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 and Tim LaHaye did a great job of, of, of laying out one possible scenario of the end times unfolding. In his view, the rapture of the church happens during, or I can't remember, during or right after the Ezekiel 38-39 war. God intervenes in the war. He raptures the church. The tribulation begins, and it's all part of the same transaction. 
And it's not just Tim LaHaye who believes that. Um, Grant Jeffries, Hal Lindsey, Amir Savati, uh, Pastor Chuck leaned that way. A, a, a number of, of very bright people who have studied prophecy deeply are, are convinced that, that those three events are, are intertwined. And they might be right. The thing is, and, and what I want you to understand tonight, nothing says they have to be. Because we get our understanding of the 70th week of Daniel from the book of Daniel, which doesn't talk about the rapture because the rapture is a church thing. It talks about Israel. That's what Gabriel's talking to Daniel about. He's talking to Daniel about Israel. And he says, in the, the second part of, of, of verse 26, the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war desolations are determined. Okay, that's the destruction of the temple that we looked at last week and the week before. That's 70 AD. That's Titus laying siege against Jerusalem under orders from Emperor Vespasian. That's the end of God's dealing with Jerusalem until verse 27. The prince who is to come shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, the final 70th week of Daniel. But in the middle of that week, a bunch of stuff happens. We'll talk about that in a moment. God's dealing with Jerusalem ends, verse 26, until a prince who shall come confirms a covenant with Israel, brokers a treaty with Israel. What do we know about this prince? We know that he's from the same people, from the same empire as the empire that sacked Jerusalem in 70 AD. Who, who overthrew Jerusalem, laid siege to Jerusalem, leveled Jerusalem in 70 AD? The Romans, yeah. They drove Israel from the land, they burned the temple, not one stone left upon another. That tells us that the future prince is going to come from a revived Roman empire. And you see that on both timelines. You see that upper left-hand corner of this one, you see the statue from Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, talked about that a couple weeks ago, where in that dream was prophesied the successive order of, of empire, starting with the Babylonians, the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans. But then there's a revived Roman empire, and you see the same thing here. If you're wondering why the funny shapes at the bottom of this timeline, it's, it's half of a statue of a man is what he's going for. And down at the end, the last part of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the last part of the prophecy in Daniel 2, is an empire that's characterized as iron mixed with clay. The Roman Empire was iron. But then we see later an empire that's iron mixed with clay. How can that be? How can there be a revived Roman Empire? Rome fell. Yes, that's true. But Rome apparently returns in some way, shape, or form. It has a lot of the qualities of the former Roman Empire, but it's mixed with something, and we don't know what the something is. Lots of people, lots of theory, lots of speculation, lots of rabbit trail I don't want to go down tonight. How can the Roman Empire return? I, I, how can Israel return? I mean, that's what people ask for centuries. Whole schools of eschatology. Schools of hermeneutics invented because people couldn't fathom Israel returning, and yet here it is. And, and tonight as we're here, Israel's trying to form a national government. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. God tells us to. They need it. God restored Israel as a nation. And, and I'd argue from a historical perspective, envisioning Rome returning to power, some kind of Roman empire, that's easier to envision than Israel. I mean, Scripture says both are going to happen, but from a secular perspective, from a historical perspective, who conquered Rome? It's a trick question. No one did. <laughs> Unless you want to say Rome conquered Rome. Roman Empire imploded. It rotted from within. And yet vest vestiges of it persist to our day, don't they? Since the time of the Roman Empire, Europe has been the dominant world power. 
um, un, un, unless you count the last hundred years or so when the United States has, has, has not even a hundred years, less than a hundred years, where the United States has risen to prominence. But you could argue, we're a British colony, you could argue a, a lot of different ways. We're an extension of Europe. So what does a revived Roman Empire look like? Some combination of the United States and Europe? Maybe just Europe? Is it the United Nations? Is it NATO? Is it the European Union? We don't know. And prophecy buffs like to obsess on the identity of this revived Roman Empire. We don't know, and odds are we're not going to know. What we know is the next thing that God says about his dealings with Israel after 70 A.D., after Israel's conquest at the hands of the same people as the coming prince, well, the next thing that he says after that is the dry bones prophecy that Israel will be returned to the land. But Daniel 9.27, the kickoff of the 70th week, time equals zero, the beginning of the 70th week is this peace treaty that the coming world leader brokers with many, not all, but many nations. We presume the nations surrounding Israel, the nations that are deeply interested in eliminating Israel. There's a fallacy that surrounds the so-called Mideast peace process, and I think that you know this because you're biblically sensitive. But there's a fallacy that surrounds and, and pervades the Mideast peace pro pro uh, process. And the fallacy is this, that somehow if we can negotiate and arrive at a magic size of Israel, if we can negotiate the right borders and the right boundaries, that everyone will be okay. That's wrong. That's, that's, that's entirely wrong, and it's dangerously wrong. Because Israel's enemies are not concerned with the size of Israel. That doesn't enter into their thinking. No, their issue is the existence of Israel. And it's an existence that they'd very, like, very much like to see come to an end. In any case, that's time equals zero, not the rapture. The rapture has to happen first for a variety of reasons. And, and, and yeah, the rapture could be part of a series of events, and, 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 and different people hypothesize it different ways. Is America, does America experience a revival? P.S., I hope so. Such that when the rapture happens, America is, is essentially crippled because so many Christians are removed, just removed from centers of population, removed from seats of power. Is, is America suddenly irrelevant or less relevant to the point where Israel's enemies feel emboldened? This is our opportunity. And that coalition of Iran and Russia and Turkey sees that moment to invade. Is it the rapture, then Ezekiel 38-39? and then Europe steps in to broker a peace after God intervenes, that, that's plausible. Those things could happen in, in, in any order. And, and I'd encourage you, don't get too hung up on that. Don't, don't try to, to, to make it a, a, a string of dominoes where one has to hit the other, has to hit the other in a certain order. Think, think about what we've been looking at on Sunday. Think about events following the crucifixion. I mean, actually go back further than that. The triumphal entry is seven days before the crucifixion, is three days before the resurrection, is 40 days before the ascension, is 10 days before Pentecost. Jesus says, tarry in Jerusalem for 10 days. Why seven days and three days and 40 days and 10 days? Well, because that fulfills prophecy. Yeah, but it begs the question, why did God order it that way? Don't get hung up on it, is, is my point. If we're, if we're talking about the history of Israel, the thing that we need to get laser focused on is sometime after the rapture and maybe before or after the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war, you could argue it either way, that coming world leader we call Antichrist brokers a treaty. So where does that leave us? Well, again, looking at Israel's future history, sometime after the church is removed, that treaty allows Israel to live in peace for three and a half years. And you see that on both of these timelines. You see a three and a half year period here in the one week, and you see a three and a half year period in the middle of this one. Why is that three and a half years significant? Because Daniel 9.27 
in the middle of this week, three and a half years into that final seven-year period, he, the coming world leader we call Antichrist, shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. We read that in Daniel 9, 27. Jesus makes reference to it in Matthew 24. He calls it the abomination of desolation. Paul makes reference to it. You don't have to turn there. But in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, remember from last year, let no one deceive you, actually verse 3, by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin, there's another title for Antichrist, is revealed. The son of perdition, there's another title, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Or at least he thinks he is. Halfway through that seven-year period, is something that Jesus calls the abomination of desolation, where Antichrist walks into the temple and demands to be worshipped as God. Now what's interesting about that, just on the way to getting where we're going, for that to happen, there's got to be a temple. Right now there isn't. Israel wants to build one and is getting really close to being ready. If you go to Jerusalem, you can visit the Temple Institute that since, I think it's 1983, I might have that date wrong, it might be 1993, for, for 30 years at least has been training priests to offer sacrifices and worship and perform all of the rites and rituals associated with temple worship. The Temple Institute is manufacturing, I think that they have manufactured most, if not all, of the furnishings and fixtures and implements necessary for temple worship. They were for years scouring the world's oceans and seas looking for the right kind of snail from which to extract the right color red or purple for priestly garments. I actually read today because I was just looking into some of this. They've abandoned the search for snails. They think that they found a worm in Israel that will provide the right color dye. And, if, and if, you, if you follow prophecy, you know that Israel continues to search for a perfect red heifer because the ashes of a perfect red heifer are, are necessary for certain temple rites and rituals. Jewish legend, Jewish records, Jewish history, not biblical history, tell us that there were only nine red heifers that, that comprised the ashes for the thousand years of, of worship before Jesus, and that the, the red heifer that they have in the millennium will be the tenth, and they're searching for one. There's a lot of particular requirements. It has to be born in Israel, chief among them, because it has to be a heifer that's never been yoked or broken. And, and if you want to get into that, I can, I can point you to some things. It's really interesting. The point is, Israel is getting ready to build a temple and worship at the temple. The only thing standing in their way, small thing, minor detail, the temple mount, the location that most people believe the temple needs to be rebuilt, is controlled by Israel's enemies. Jews are currently banned from praying at the Temple Mount, and, and from time to time are banned completely from the Temple Mount. So that's a small detail. There's, there's a minority report, there's a minority perspective that thinks that it's possible to rebuild the Temple without interfering with the Dome of the Mosque, that maybe we're looking at the wrong site. And, and they've got arguments and, and maps and depth, depth soundings why they think that that might be true. That's, that's one scenario. The other is that it's part of this coming world leader's negotiations with Israel's enemies. It's part of this peace treaty that allows Israel to finally rebuild her temple. Something happens. Something happens. And for three and a half years, the first half of this seven-week period, Israel is dwelling in the land and worshiping at the temple until three and a half years in, all hell breaks loose. You read in the middle of, of, of the, the biblical timeline, here at the very top, it says Satan thrown down from heaven. And very possibly at that point indwells Antichrist. 
whether that's true or not, persecution of Jews and Christians begins to an extent that the world has rarely seen. Now we know from Revelation and other prophetic sources, the first three and a half years is, is not a garden picnic for, for the world. Almost from the beginning of the seven-year period, God begins pouring out a series of judgments on the world. And, and when we study Revelation, we get into the seal judgments and the bowl judgments and the trumpet judgments and which judgment happened in which order at which time. That's the subject of a lot of debate I won't want to get into tonight. Broad terms for our purposes this evening. For the first three and a half years, the world is not calm. Treaty holds, but the world is shaken. There's war. Revelation 6, there's famine, there's earthquakes, there's darkness. A quarter of the world perishes. We read about that in Revelation 6. Jesus references it in Matthew 24. Those are the seal judgments. And I guess there's a decent consensus that the seal judgments happen early in that seven-year period. But those seal judgments, gruesome as they are, nothing compared to the middle of the tribulation. Nothing compared to that, that halfway mark where the treaty is broken, Antichrist is demanding to be worshipped, the mark of the beast becomes a thing, you have to have it to buy and sell, and accepting the mark is tantamount to worshipping the beast, they're one and the same, and persecution of Jews and believers who refuse the mark goes up to 11. It's a time when perhaps more than any period of history, at least since the early days of the church, people are forced to choose. If you refuse to take the mark, you can't buy or sell. Failure to take the mark is failure to worship Antichrist is, is certain death. Refusal to take the mark is, is immediate martyrdom. But see, at the same time that's happening, God's pulling out all of the stops to tell people, you've got another choice. You can die in this life or you can die forever because worshiping Antichrist is, is, is to ensure eternal death. And God's pulling all of the stops. Sounds on 144,000 believing Jews from Israel in Revelation 7 to, to be witnesses. Sends two prophets in Revelation 11. And we like to speculate on who they were. Is it Enoch and Elijah because they never died? Is it Elijah and Moses because the miracles they do are similar? Argument for another night. But two supernaturally empowered prophets witnessing to the risen Christ. An angel from one end of the world to another proclaiming the risen Christ. Trivia question. You can stump your friends sometime. When does the greatest revival in the history of the world happen? And some people will say, oh, was it the Jesus movement of the 60s? Was it the Azusa Street Revival in the turn of the century? Was it back in the days of Josiah? No, it's going to be during the seven-year period. It's going to be during the 70th week of Daniel. But at the same time that God is saying, return to me, give your life to me, Judgment of increasing severity is, is, is poured out on the world as if to say, but you better do it fast <laughs> because I don't know how much time you have left. Revelation 8, and, and I don't have a graphic here because I, I, I don't want to get hung up on when these things happen. Just, just let me read it and listen to the scope. Revelation 8, a third of the world's vegetation burned. A third of the sea turns to blood. A third of the fresh water is polluted. A third of the light coming from the sun is darkened. Revelation 9, locusts torment people but don't kill people for five months. Revelation 9, a two million person army annihilates a third of the world's population. And that could be before or after Antichrist. After Antichrist, Revelation 16, we've got the bowl judgments boils on the followers of antichrist the sea turns to blood fresh water turns to blood people are scorched by uv radiation and they curse god darkness falls on the earth the euphrates is dried up greatest earthquake in the history of the world happens hundred pound hailstones come from heaven babylon is destroyed and with every next phase of judgment is is the implicit message you better choose now because any moment you might lose your ability to choose. All of which sets the stage for the climactic showdown. It's clear that these judgments are coming from God. And so the kings of the world, loyal to Antichrist, mass in the Middle East. 
and they surround Israel with the intent of destroying God's people as a way, I don't know, to strike back at God. They surround Jerusalem and especially the people of Jerusalem who have refused to bow to Antichrist, when what happens? Bef yes. But before we go there, why? Why has everything that's happened up to this point in those seven years, why has it happened? And for the answer, we go back to where we began, to Daniel 9.24. Because Gabriel says, this is why it's going to happen. This is the plan and the purpose, part one, to finish transgression. And, and people who don't agree that God has a future for Israel will go to places like Isaiah 13, 9, and say, behold, the day of the Lord comes cruel with both wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate, and he'll destroy its sinners from it. And then certainly that's part of God's plan, to judge the nations. But remember, Daniel is hearing from Gabriel about what? Israel and Jerusalem. And what Daniel hears is actually to finish the transgression. What was Israel's transgression? She rejected her Messiah. But God loves Israel too much. Just, just like he loved us too much to leave us as enemies after the garden, God loves Israel too much. He's got, a complain, uh, he's got a plan to complete his judgment while drawing the remnant of Israel back to him. Part two of the why for the seven years. To make an end of sin. Now, is that to put an end of sin in the world? Yeah. Because at the end of this, new heaven and new earth and new beginning. But again, if we're looking at Israel specifically because this is Israel to whom the prophecy was spoken... To put an end, to, to seal up, literally is what the Hebrew is, Israel's cup of iniquity. Israel's cup of iniquity is overflowing. But in the seven-year period, God is going to both judge her sin and end her sin. Zechariah 13.9. God says this about it. I'll bring one-third through the fire. We'll refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say this is my people and each one will say the Lord is my God. Israel's sin, Israel's rejection of Jesus is going to end and it's going to end forever. It'll be sealed up forever. Third purpose, to make reconciliation of iniquity, to, to atone for wickedness, another translation. At the end of these seven years, Israel will have her wickedness dealt with and be reconciled to her God. How? Same way we are today, by the blood of Jesus Christ. The same Jesus they handed over to be crucified. When? We prayed for the peace of Jerusalem earlier tonight. When does the peace of Jerusalem actually happen? When the Prince of Peace comes. Peace of Jerusalem that we pray for in, in obedience to God and on so many of our prayer lists. Peace of Jerusalem happens only when the Prince of Peace comes. When does the Prince of Peace come? Jesus told us in Matthew 23, 29, you'll not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You won't see me again, Jesus says, until you acknowledge that I was who I claimed to be. Why does Satan hate the Jewish people so very much? I mean, all through history, you can, you, can, you, can, you can look at history as one ongoing attempt to eradicate the Jewish people. Esther. Esther makes sense because if Satan had succeeded in the book of Esther, if, if he had completed the genocide that he was beginning, he could have kept Messiah from being born because Satan knows prophecy. And he knows that Messiah was going to come from Israel, from the tribe of Judah, from the line of David. Wipe out all of Israel. That can't happen. No Messiah. Satan remains prince of this world. So we can understand why before the cross, Satan was hell-bent, if you'll pardon the expression, on eradicating the Jewish people. Why does he still have such a virulent hatred of the Jews? Is, is, is he just a sore loser? Maybe, but I suspect it's more than that. 
I think if we look at the Holocaust and all of the other examples of anti-Semitism that have happened throughout history, I think Satan heard Jesus when he said, you won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And I think Satan is throwing one last desperate pass if he can keep Israel from repenting, he can keep Jesus from returning. And if he can wipe out Israel, then there's no Israel to repent and Jesus won't come back. I might be wrong, but I, I wonder if that isn't true. But Jesus is going to return is the thing. Because Israel is going to repent. He's going to return. He's going to bring in, here's the fourth thing, everlasting righteousness. With Israel's repentance at that end of the four-year period, a new season begins on God's calendar. And a relationship, the relationship that God always wanted to have with his people will actually arise. At the end of seven years, all of these purposes come together. The believing remnant of Israel, seeing Jerusalem surrounded, annihilation certain, cries out. Remember last week in Ezekiel 37, we talked about the physical return of Israel being different than the spiritual return? The spiritual return happens at the end of these seven years. At the end of these seven years, Zechariah chapter 12 I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. At the end of those seven years, we see the fulfillment of Psalm 79. Oh God, the nations have come into your inheritance into Jerusalem. Your holy temple they've defiled. They've laid Jerusalem in heaps. The dead bodies of your servants they've given as food for the birds of the heavens, the flesh of your saints to the beasts of the earth. Their blood they've shed like water all around Jerusalem and there is no one to bury them. We've become a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and derision to those who are around us. How long, O Lord, will your jealousy burn like fire? Will you be angry forever? Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not know you and on the kingdoms that do not call on your name. And it continues, but, but, but you, get the, you get the sense. At the end of those seven years, Zechariah 14, verse 4. The Lord will go forth, verse 3, and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And then that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west. Jesus will return. When he returns, that fifth purpose will be fulfilled to seal up vision and prophecy. Because there won't be need for further prophecy. There are still some prophecies that will be let yet to be fulfilled, but no, no more prophecies will be spoken because Jesus will be there. There won't be a need for prophecy. People will see Jesus face to face. And then finally, the, Daniel 9, 24, the sixth and final purpose for those 70 weeks that 70th week, to anoint the most holy. There's wonderful symmetry to this. The beginning of Matthew 24, when Jesus speaks of these things, when Jesus sits the disciples down and points them back to Daniel 9 and talks to them about these things, he leaves the temple. And at the end of these seven years, he returns to the temple. At the end of the fulfillment of those things, Jesus returns to the temple. It's impossible for it to happen before Israel's national repentance. God knows it's going to take exactly this much wrath to bring them to repentance, but he knows that exactly this much wrath will bring them to repentance. And that's where we'll pick up next week, because you can see on the timeline, there's still stuff, this is your right, still stuff off to the right. There's still more to happen. We'll talk about the battle of Armageddon and the return of Jesus and the events leading up to the millennial kingdom and the thousand years of Jesus ruling and reigning and then how it ends. More to cover. And again, as we have every week, I, I've, I've got to say, 
we, we stayed at 30,000 feet. We didn't get into a lot of details. And if, if there's something that you want to take a deeper dive into, I, I can point you to resources. Hit me up, I, seriously. People, people, people have been doing that, and it's, it's the, one of the best parts of my week is to follow up after Wednesdays. Okay, this person wanted this chart, and this person wanted this article, and this person wanted resources on this. That, that tells me that we're doing something here. That, that tells me that, that we're engaging with God and with his word here, and that's exciting for me. But as we wrap up, it's, 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 it's worth pausing just for a moment to, to note even in the middle of cataclysmic disasters and apocalyptic judgments, God has purpose. Daniel 9.24 is important to keep in mind as you read Revelation and other prophetic scripture because we can, we can, we can get all hung up on the, the just the destruction the, the enormity of the wrath that's being poured out. We have to, to keep a title page, a, a headline over it. God has a purpose. And his primary purpose is to persuade people to choose him. Jew and Gentile both, but especially Jew. We tend to focus on the, on the judgment and with good reason, but we have to remember that even in judgment, God remembers mercy. He doesn't destroy the world utterly. He doesn't destroy his people, Israel. Yes, he condemns those who are unwilling to repent, but he rescues those who desire to be saved. God has purpose in the tribulation. And his purpose is always to draw us back into a relationship with him. His purpose is always to restore relationship to those who want it, those who are willing to repent and cry out for it. More than anything, the, the, the destruction of the tribulation is to remind people they have a choice and they better make it quick. Time is short. We should already know that. And we still need to know that. Yes, most of us here on a Wednesday night have already chosen him. And praise God. But are we choosing him Jesus said, follow me, and we followed him to the cross. Are we still following him? Have we followed him from the cross? Did we follow him to Pentecost? Have we followed him to the baptism of the Spirit, to the work that he prepared for us, the ministry that he's gifted us for? The tribulation reminds us horrible things happen in this world, but always with God's permission. And if with his permission, then with his purpose. And God, God's purposes are always good, even if we can't see it at the time. You, you've heard the illustration, I know you have. The story about the two masked people who rush into a child's bedroom in the middle of the night, tie him up, carry him out, take him across town to a strange place he's never been before. Other people come in, knock him out, stab him in the stomach. Sounds horrible until I tell you that that's the story of an ambulance and rescue workers going to take a child with a burst appendix to a hospital so that he can be operated on. Whatever's going on in your life right now, worth remembering, whatever it is, God has allowed it and he has purpose in it. And, and, it's, and it's the same purposes that we just read about, to draw you closer to him and to make you more like him so that you can use, be used by him. So as we wrap up, why, why not be like Israel tonight? Next week we're going to get into the millennial kingdom and, and, and you're going to hear from Patrick's greatest hits tape the things that will be true for Israel and the kingdom can be true for the believer today. Something that I say every time we touch down in prophetic scripture. The things that will be true when Jesus is ruling and reigning in Jerusalem can be true for us if Jesus is ruling and reigning on our hearts. But see, that's true for the tribulation as well. What we just saw this evening, when Israel calls upon the Lord, he hears and he saves and he protects and he leads. 
when we cry out to the Lord, he hears and he saves and he protects and he leads. Lord, we cry out to you tonight. And we're so grateful that your character shines through out of, out of some really dark passages of Scripture. Almost unimaginable judgment, just heaped one after the other. Lord, your purpose shines through, your character shines through, your love is undiminished. And your prophecy is fulfilled. Lord, your prophecy for us is that we would go out, that we would be witnesses, that we would build your church, that we would make disciples. Lord, we, have, we, we, we present ourselves to you. We cry out to you. And yes, even as believers, we... We seek our own things and we go our own way. Lord, we repent of that tonight and we cry out and we say, have your way with us. The history that you've written in advance, use our lives to fulfill it. And we pray these things in Jesus' name.